During the next minutes, I will tell you two stories about two different diskettes. One of them changed my life completely, and one of them could maybe change your life as well. But let's first of all go to the beginning. I was born in a very nice city called Mechelen, in the middle of Belgium. And when I was growing up, I always wanted to become an astronaut. Uh, but, you know, this is something like a typical boy's dream. And actually, I loved much more programming my small calculator or programming my first computer. And when I finally decided what I wanted to do or wanted to study for, my real dream, however, was to, well, help people. I wanted to become a surgeon or a doctor, but I can't see blood, so I went for computer sciences. And, well, after my studies, about five years after my studies, in 1989, the real, my first real story happened. And I still remember it very well. It was on a Monday morning in December. At that moment, I was working for an insurance company. The manager came to me and handed me over a floppy, a floppy disk labeled with AIDS information. And he told me, Eddie, can you have a look at it? Maybe it could be interesting for our customers. So I watched, I looked at the diskette, and it was delivered with a leaflet, an information leaflet. And at the back of it, you could easily find the uh, end of user license agreement. So I immediately put the diskette inside the computer, and I started up the program. And this was the first screen which appeared. And I thought, what is this? Well, anyway, it asked me to put in my medical information. And afterwards, it was printing out on a matrix printer some statistical information about the AIDS disease. Hmm, not that interesting, I thought. So I went back to my manager and I told him, well, I don't think it's really valuable. I'm possibly going to throw away that diskette very soon. Now, a couple of days passed on, and on Wednesday morning, I booted up my machine again. And this was the first screen which appeared. And I couldn't access my data anymore. And the only thing I could do at that moment was clicking on the return key, which I did. And then this screen came up. And it was asking me to send $189 to a peer box in Panama. I thought, what is happening over here? So at that moment, I wasn't aware of it, but I encountered the very, very first ransomware. And that's actually what ransomware is doing. It's blocking your machine or network. It's encrypting your data. It's asking a ransom for it. And if you pay the ransom, it will eventually give you a decryption key to unlock your data. And we see many of those. At this moment, we see millions of those attacks worldwide. And I got confronted with the first one. And actually, it became a real big problem. It's one of the biggest IT security problems related to security at this moment. And, well, let's go back to 1989. The interesting part was that I got a solution for it within 15 minutes. And that, of course, was quite interesting for the media. So I got my first television interview. Well, this was me, you know. Uh, uh, well, there's a little bit of difference, I know. Um, my gray hair comes for every virus I found afterwards, I think. Anyway, let's go back to the real thing. Let's go back to the damage and the creation. Let's go back to the diskette itself. It was created by a biologist, Dr. Joseph L. Pop, and it was given away as a freebie during the World Health Organization conference. And more than 20,000 copies were sent to the mailing list of PC World magazine through postal services. Now, a lot of research, of eight research, was gone. So it created really a lot of damage that day. And 
very interesting detail, Dr. Joseph L. Pop was declared mentally unfit, so he escaped the trials. But what did I do wrong? Well, I didn't read the end of user license agreement. Who reads the end of user license agreement? Well, and it was clearly stated that if you want to use the software, you need to pay, which I didn't. Anyway, it pushed me inside the security industry. Well, not immediately. Uh, it took me about two years when I went to the first constitutional conference of the ICAR organization. And the ICAR organization is known for the ICAR test file. The ICAR test file, you still can use it, by the way, and you, can, you still can find it on the internet. It's actually a test virus to find out if your security program is working or not. Well, that first organization is important because it brought me in contact with the second organization, which is called the Wildlist Organization. And that second organization is important for my second story. Now, that second organization, the Wildlist Organization, created what we call the Wildlist. And the Wildlist is something like a top 100 of the most seen malware and viruses well, during the past month. And they were helped with by a lot of researchers, and I was one of them. Actually, this is an old picture uh, of it, of, of those researchers. And we always sent samples of the viruses to them so that it was centralized and that you, very got, that you got a very good overview about all the recent viruses. Very interesting at least. Anyway, um, if you look at the picture, I'm inside the picture. Two of my best friends are inside the picture. Mikko Hipponen, a very famous TED speaker, is in the picture. There is even a billionaire in the picture. I must have been doing something wrong in my life, I think. Anyway, let's go to the second story. Well, the second story happened in 2001. And in 2001, I think we all know what happened in 2001, 9-11. Just after 9-11, there was a um, Saudi Arabian oil company, a very big one, um, asking to help them out with the creation of a security policy. And, uh, well, nobody wanted to travel anymore to the Middle Eastern area, except this crazy guy. Yeah, well... And I still remember it quite well, because I needed to travel on a Saturday, and on a Friday, just before, um, I was still doing a clean-up of a very problematic computer virus in a big company in Belgium. And, um, well, I always copied some samples of that virus on a diskette, which I always got with me. And I, I needed to do that to send it back to the Wildlist organization for the creation of the whitelist. So I took the diskette with me, and I got the diskette with me on my travel to Saudi Arabia. So I arrived around midnight uh, Saturday evening in Saudi Arabia. And, well, the airport was crowded, and it took me an hour to get to the customs area. And when I finally arrived at the customs area, the customs agent was searching, well, inside my luggage to find something which was not allowed to bring inside Saudi Arabia. And he found my diskette. So he took out my diskette out of my pocket, he ripped out my passport out of my hand, and he called a security officer. And they ran away with it. I thought, what's happening over here? And I shouted at him, and I told him, don't touch the diskette. I'm an antivirus expert. There are viruses on the diskette. And it's actually clearly stated on the diskette, you know? Look at this. Well... Can you believe it, all the staring faces at the airport, if you say that you're an antivirus expert? Well, you know the feeling. Well, anyway, um, the only response I got from the customs agent was, well, uh, you will get everything back at the office at the end of the airport. So I went to the office at the end of the airport. And there was a big uh, row, a queue, waiting over there from people. Uh, and it was a big window as well, so I could clearly see what, what the security officer was doing over there. And he was actually checking all the diskettes. And 
what can you what can fit on a diskette? Well, he was actually looking for porn on a diskette. Well, 1.2 megabytes, oh, that's not that much. Anyway, um, and I saw him clicking on the viruses on my diskettes. If you do something like that, well, you don't see anything happening. Everything is happening in the background. You get an error message or something like that. But of course, you are infecting your machine. And there was a network cable coming out of that computer. I thought, oh no. Oh no, this is not good. Anyway, I got my diskette back, I got my passport back, I ran out of the airport and I took a taxi to my hotel. Ten days passed on. And I wanted to return home, so I went back to the airport. I arrived at the airport and it was crowded all over the place again. I thought, what's happening over here? So after three hours I arrived at the check-in counter and I was handed over a written boarding pass. It's not the original one, this one. Anyway, um, I asked the agent, what, is, what happened over here? Well, we can't print printing everything over here. It's impossible, uh, Mr. Williams. Uh, we got a computer problem since about nine to 10 days. Uh, so I possibly infected the whole airport. Was it me again? What did I do wrong now? Well, I didn't use encryption. If I would have used encryption, I could have prevented the whole problem. So did I learn something from all those stories and from the travels? Actually, I did. Actually, I created what I call a formula which is describing a cybersecurity problem. And a cybersecurity problem is always related to the human factor and to the technological factor. The human factor is our curiosity, our naivety, because we want to see everything. We want to see what the invoice is. We want to see the picture on your email. Uh, you know, we are clicking on every link. That's the human factor. And the technological factor is the malware, the virus, the malicious links, the fake website the vulnerabilities, the weaknesses in the software. And that's what I call the basics of cybersecurity. If you look at ransomware, it's exactly the problem what we see over here. It's describing that problem. Because we are clicking on the wrong links. Of course there is security software, and that will help us. But sometimes it's not up to date, or sometimes it's not protecting against the very, very new samples of it. And then we click on the wrong link and we have the problem. Or the administrator didn't do an update on the service. And I got another good example of this one. Um, the world's biggest data breaches. You can have a look and you can find it on the internet. Um, in 2005, there was one blob. Now you have loads of blobs, loads of data leaks. And all those data leaks, it became a trend. And guess what? Most of those data leaks are, common, are coming from human error, from human mistakes. 95% this is research from IBM. Newer research from AZ Thought Lab is saying that 87% is coming from human mistakes. So it's our human behavior which is the real problem. So how can we change that? How can we change our human behavior? Well, just follow what I call, well, improve what I call security awareness. And how can you do that? Well, by participating in security awareness courses. Online, for instance. You can find them. Or by watching security lectures, like this one. It's very interesting, but on the long end, I think the only solution, which is possible in my opinion, is well to put that inside the basic education worldwide. And that's what we should do. And make it repetitive. Because, you know, people tend to forget. So it's very important to do that. There's another interesting talk about education, by the way, during this event. So watch that space. Um, but, what else did I do wrong during this talk? Haha, I was sharing too much information, isn't it? I told you where I was born. I told you a couple of 
very important dates in my life. I told you what I like to do or to become. This information can be misused easily by hackers or cyber criminals. So I possibly will get some attacks after this talk, I suppose. Um, so that's not good. Uh, so how can we handle that? Well, use what I call a memory aid. A memory aid just to remind you to take the right decision, just to remind you to not to share too much information, not always on social media, but also on other websites, for instance. So use a memory aid. And my memory aid, well, that's my floppy. This is the original and only, well, there are a couple of versions still left. This is possibly one of the last remaining feasible copies worldwide of the AIDS information disk, the very, very first ransomware. And a museum offered me about 1,000 euros for it. But I'm not going to sell it. No, I'm not going to sell it. It's hanging on the wall of my living room. And it's reminding me to take the right decision when it's needed. And that's also what you should do. Put something on your wall. Create a picture of your loved one with a computer or something like that to remind you to take the right decision. It helps. Or put a poster with some security tips and put that on your wall. That's what you should do. It helps, really. And that's what I daily do. That's, well, describing or, you know, putting those cybersecurity tips into layman's terms. And I finally succeeded. <laughs> I wanted to help people, and I hope I've helped you today as well. Thank you. <laughs>